destination, the moon. Eight years, legions of men, brilliant rocket scientists, industrial giants, and thousands of engineers. The technology they created was powerful, breathtaking, and dangerous. Soon, three brave men would ride atop the mighty rocket, and for a priceless moment, the world would be united in wonder. Now, Apollo 11 on Modern Marvels. July 16, 1969, 9.32 a.m. T-minus 15 seconds, guidance is internal. The monster rocket, the Saturn V, was ready to hurl three men into Earth orbit, then onward to the moon. 10, 9, ignition sequence starts. Tense controllers sweated out the count as this epic flight of the Apollo program, the first attempt to land on the moon, prepared to head into the morning skies, driven by seven and a half million pounds of thrust. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff, we have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. With it would go the hopes and dreams of millions of Americans, and indeed, the world. Riding the rocket that July morning was one of NASA's brightest minds, Dr. Edwin Buzz Aldrin. I certainly didn't come away with the impression that the ride on the Saturn was at all a wild ride. It was just a, a smooth movement back, most all of it really during uh, first stage. Project Apollo was boosted to public awareness a scant eight years earlier, in May of 1961. The setting was a joint session of Congress. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or more important for the long-range exploration of space. And with that, the American space program was handed its greatest challenge, to put a man on the moon. This program had been established by President John F. Kennedy as a response to the Soviet challenge to demonstrate America's superiority, and in particular, the superiority of a free and open society. What America can dare, America will do. The Soviets had beat us with the first satellite, Sputnik, uh, and that had been a tremendous shock to the national psyche in this country. As Kennedy took office in the spring of 1961, they beat us again with the first man in space, Yuri Gagarin. As Gagarin orbited the Earth, it became clear that the U.S. was playing catch-up. After Gagarin's flight, Kennedy asked his advisors, what can we do in space that would be dramatic, where if we tried as hard as we could, we could win, and the Soviets wouldn't? Just three weeks after Gagarin's flight, NASA would attempt America's first manned spaceflight. On May 5, 1961, Alan Shepard climbed atop the tiny Redstone booster and into a Mercury capsule for a short 15-minute suborbital flight. At that time, the moon seemed very far away indeed. Shepard flew for a brief 15 minutes in a suborbital path to an altitude of 116 miles. From the periscope, what a beautiful view. But the redstone was far too small to fly to the moon. The next step to a manned moon landing was Project Gemini. From 1964 through 1966, Gemini would perfect the navigation and rendezvous skills needed for a moon flight. The Titan II, larger and more powerful than the Redstone, generated about 430,000 pounds of thrust. But going to the moon would require a much larger rocket. Well, we need a very large, reliable booster uh, in, in the class of, of over 1.3 million pounds of thrust 
per engine because that was a leap from 400,000 pounds to you know, almost a factor of three or four to anything that we had built in terms of size. But that's what was required for the Apollo program. The F-1 would use kerosene and add liquid oxygen for an oxidizer to allow it to burn. Early versions of the F-1 were unstable and dangerous. Changes were needed. The analysis done without benefit mostly of computers, but using slide rules and desk calculators. A lot of it was trial and error. Frankly, the existence of all the computers now doesn't change that too much. It's a brand new field doing something that hasn't been done before. There's no textbook on how to build an F-1 engine. By 1966, the F-1 engine had become one of the most reliable rocket engines ever made. Five F-1 engines clustered onto a huge tank comprised the first stage of the Saturn V moon rocket. This first stage alone was 33 feet in diameter and 138 feet tall. The engines generated over 160 million horsepower. The Saturn was a monster of a machine and had the thrust of over 540 jet fighters. You know, Norman Mailer wrote after watching the Apollo 11 launch that mankind had finally found a way to talk to God. Inside the booster's tanks, a half million gallons of kerosene and liquid oxygen were devoured in two and a half minutes. The pumps that drove the fuel into the combustion chamber had the force of 30 diesel locomotives. In its brief life, the first stage would accelerate the rocket to over 6,000 miles per hour. But the Saturn V was a three-stage rocket. Above the first stage loomed the second and third stages. Both were propelled by a radically more advanced rocket engine, which utilized some of the most powerful fuels known to man, hydrogen and oxygen. It was called the J-2. The second stage had five J-2 engines and would burn 350,000 gallons of fuel in just six minutes, driving the spacecraft to 15,000 miles per hour. The third, or S-4B stage, had one J-2 engine. This last single power plant would thrust them into Earth orbit at 17,500 miles per hour. These engines were ready to fly by the time Apollo 1 was undergoing final tests in 1967. But Project Apollo was about to suffer a tragic failure. At launch, had a fully fueled Saturn V exploded, it would have had the force of a small nuclear bomb. Apollo 11 will return on Modern Marvels here on the History Channel. On January 27, 1967, the unthinkable happened. Apollo 1 was just one of a regular series of tests as we were preparing for, uh, for the uh, first, first Apollo manned mission. Grissom, White, and Chaffee had been together and working and training. They'd spent a lot of time here at the Cape. Uh, that particular day, things were not going well. Gus Grissom, veteran of the Mercury and Gemini programs, was NASA's most seasoned astronaut and one of the most colorful. Gruff Gus, as he was called, was not happy with the lack of progress that day. With him were Ed White, another Gemini veteran and America's first spacewalker, and the soft-spoken rookie, Roger Chaffee. We were looking to wrap it up when it's, I'll never forget, it was 6.31 p.m. and we all heard the same thing, fire in the spacecraft, and uh, it just stunned everybody. They decided to turn off all the phones, and I went to the launch director and said, I've got to have a phone because I've got to get the word out to my people to plan and that type of thing. We were, wanted to check on the status of the crew, although it was pretty obvious that something horrendous had happened. It was the worst accident in the Apollo program. The early design for the command module had many problems. One of them was combustibility. On that day, astronauts Grissom, Chaffee, and White traded their lives for a complete redesign of the Apollo capsule. Within months, NASA had completed its investigation and North American Rockwell had corrected the deficiencies. The new command module was better in every way, and with two million parts, 566 switches, and over 15 miles of wire, 
it was the most complex flying machine ever built. This new capsule was mated to the service module, which housed the life support for the crew, as well as the rocket engine and fuel needed to enter and exit lunar orbit. The service module contained cryogenic fuels that needed to be well insulated. The fuel tanks were so well designed that if placed in a room temperature environment, the super cold fuel would take almost nine years to rise above zero. Apollos 2 through 6 would be unmanned tests of the Saturn V, the command and service modules, and the lunar module. The combined command and service module was first tested with astronauts on board in October of 1968 on the Earth orbital flight of Apollo 7, the first manned Apollo flight. A few months later, just before Christmas 1968, Apollo 8 would attempt a daring flight. Apollo 8 uh, coming to you live from the moon. Orbiting the moon without a lunar module. It was a risky gambit. America was in a race with the Soviets and wanted Apollo to orbit the moon before they could get there. And from the crew of Apollo 8, we close with good night, good luck, a Merry Christmas, and God bless all of you, all of you on the good Earth. Had anything gone wrong with the command or service modules, and with no lunar module lifeboat, the three men might never have returned home. After Apollo 8's triumphal return, there were two more missions slated to test critical aspects of the moon landing before Apollo 11. Apollo 9 tested the lunar module, or LEM, in Earth orbit, along with the new Apollo spacesuit. It's a nice looking machine. So is yours. Then, Apollo 10, flew the LEM to within just nine miles of the moon's surface. They were close enough to land. But after barnstorming the moon, Stafford and Cernan returned to the command module and headed home. The landing attempt would be saved for the next flight, Apollo 11. Now that's affirmative. I am reading the numbers on our monitor here. On July 17, 1969, Apollo 11 was 12 orbits into its mission the astronauts fired the third stage rocket engine to leave the comparative safety of Earth orbit and head off to the moon. The S-4B burn sent the spacecraft into translunar space at a final speed of 24,000 miles per hour. Roger, Houston, Apollo 11. Calling in from about 130,000 miles out. The three astronauts were now crossing the quarter million mile void between the Earth and the moon. Would you believe you're looking at uh, chicken stew here? All you have to do is three ounces of hot water for five or ten minutes. Their commander, Neil Armstrong, was typically a shy, almost reticent man. But on camera, in space, he was all smiles. Yeah, Neil's standing on his head again. He's trying to make me nervous. The Apollo 11 crew really had three very different kinds of people. Neil Armstrong, very intelligent. Uh, I mean. Mike Collins even referred to his towering intelligence. He lived it, he breathed it, he'd been obsessed with aviation since he was a small child. This burning intelligence was something he shared with another crewman, Buzz Aldrin, the lunar module pilot. I think the word that comes to mind when I think of Buzz is complex. It's somebody who just is able to think on levels that most of us wouldn't even try. In fact, he pioneered a method for completing a space rendezvous with a failed computer, if needed. How could you do it with only line of sight and maybe radar ranging information? How could you process this to, to make corrections to stay on an intercept trajectory? The theories Aldrin developed in his doctoral work at MIT helped to design the orbital rendezvous techniques for both Gemini and Apollo. Finally, there was the command module pilot, Mike Collins. Mike Collins is really kind of the, uh, the counterweight to Armstrong and Aldrin on this crew. He's the one that you could imagine sitting down with and having a beer and just having a, a really great connection with. The spacecraft they shared was designed to be a quantum leap beyond the Mercury and Gemini capsules. It was much larger and more capable. The command module itself was still incredibly complex. I mean, if you look at just this, this cone-shaped craft that had to be crammed with all these different systems, you know, the environmental control system to provide the oxygen and 
the cabin atmosphere and keep the astronauts comfortable and maintain the pressure inside the cabin. And then attached to that command module, the service module, this, this cylinder that contained the main rocket engine that they would get into and out of lunar orbit. The service module engine was responsible for putting them into orbit around the moon, and more importantly, taking them out of that orbit and sending them back home. Three days after launch, Collins fired the engine, and the 21,000 pounds of thrust slowed the spacecraft, allowing it to fall into a lunar orbit. And the engine was designed beautifully with uh, as much simplicity as possible. It was an engine that used the fuel that was called hypergolic. Hypergolic fuel is fuel that will ignite on contact, so you don't need an ignition system. Apollo 11 was in lunar orbit. Their voyage had been long, and they were ready to get on with the next phase of the mission, to attempt a landing on the moon. But navigating the command module and lunar module involved challenges never before faced by any pilot. In an age when computers could fill an entire room, something compact and very smart would be needed to steer these spacecraft. The guidance and navigation system was amazing. And today, when I look back at it 35 years ago, it was even more amazing. It had all of 60,000 words in it. Today, if you don't have gigabytes of memory, you uh, don't seem to be able to get along. The computer that landed in the landing module was built specifically one time for that mission. At 70 pounds and about one square foot in size, it was considered compact. The lunar module computer was a marvel of engineering for its time. An identical twin would steer the command module. The little handheld calculator that you could go in and buy at Walmart would be as powerful as the guidance computer we had on the landing vehicle. But as Armstrong and Aldrin were preparing the lunar module to descend, Mission Control was worried about an unanticipated event that could greatly impact Apollo 11. The Apollo command module could sustain a quarter inch hole and still maintain survivable cabin pressure for 15 minutes, providing the astronauts enough time to get into their spacesuits. Apollo 11 will return on Modern Marvels. July 20th, Apollo 11 had been orbiting the moon for just under a day. As Armstrong and Aldrin powered up the LEM and began hours of checks and double checks, they received worrisome news from the ground. Mission control was spreading over an intruder into their mission. The Soviets had sent an unmanned probe into lunar orbit, coinciding with the arrival of Apollo 11. Attempts had been made to contact the Russians, but nobody was as yet quite clear on what the rogue craft was for, or if its orbit might present a danger to the Apollo 11 crew. The Soviets were actually trying to pull off a sample return mission, a robotic sample return mission. It was called Luna 15, and it was supposed to land on the moon, collect a sample, and bring it back to Earth. It certainly didn't hurt that it would have upstaged Apollo 11, but it didn't. It, uh, it crashed on the moon. With the Soviet threat eliminated, Armstrong and Aldrin awaited the go from Houston for powered descent. They would be the first either to reach the surface, abort a landing, or die trying. The lunar module was the first true spacecraft ever built, in that it would never operate in an atmosphere. Our design, of course, at that time was mainly driven by aeronautical engineers. The lunar module, of course, was not going to be constrained with aerodynamics. It was going to operate in the vacuum of space. But to land on and depart from the moon, the LEM had to be lightened. The earlier lunar modules had been too heavy. So they started throwing away all of the extra stuff. They took out the seats because the astronauts would only fly in one-sixth gravity or in weightlessness, and so they didn't need seats. The weight-saving program produced a lunar module that was capable, but structurally very lightly built. Instead of a metal skin, much of the lower stage was simply wrapped in mylar foil. Some of the astronauts took to calling it the tissue paper spacecraft. Even the parts where there were metal, like the skin of the crew cabin, was just a fraction of an inch thick. So this was 
It was like a very taut aluminum balloon. The overall design of the lunar module pushed Grumman engineers to their limits. A particularly difficult task was designing the descent stage engine that would land them on the moon. It had to have variable thrust to allow them to hover and search for a landing site. So they, they developed this engine that could be throttled like a car. And if you look at the landing profile, you see that it starts out at 100% and then it throttles down partway through. Then there was the ascent engine. Its only task was to return the two men to orbit. But if it failed, the men would be doomed to spend the rest of their short lives on the moon. The reliability of that one had to be perfect, you know, because you're not leaving if that thing doesn't work. Uh, so the idea was in, in, in rocketry is simple means high reliability. The only moving parts were two valves. If they were opened, the ascent module would fly. It was 4 p.m. on July 20th, Eastern Daylight Time, over 102 hours into the mission. The Eagle was ready for a landing on the moon. Michael Collins, alone in the command module, slowly circled the moon in a different orbit. He was standing by either to attempt a rescue if the landing was aborted or cheer if it succeeded. Both spacecraft were now behind the moon and out of communication with Earth. On the ground in Houston, Gene Kranz was the flight director for the landing. As he listened to static, waiting for the Eagle to emerge from behind the moon, he used this moment for one last pep talk. So I called my controllers onto this loop for a very personal conversation, because this was very emotional for me, uh, emotional moment. And I really wanted to tell my team how much I believed in them and what I thought of them and what I felt they were capable of. And that even though this is something that had never been done before, I believe that A, we were the right team at the right place. And this day, we would make it happen. And from that moment forward, no, no controller would enter or leave the room until one of three things had happened. We would either land on the moon, we would crash attempting to land, or we would abort. And the uh, final two outcomes were not good. The lunar module was now back in communication, but the link with the ground was spotty. Gene Kranz was concerned. So it's purely my decision as to how much information is enough. Well, the kind of information you're looking for is telemetry information and voice information. So this is now going through my mind, do I have enough to continue? And the answer was yes. OK, retro. Go. Fido. Go. Guide. Go. Control. Go. Telcom. Go. Ginsey. Go. Ecom. Go. Surgeon. Go. Capcom word. Go to continue PDI. So I gave the crew the go to uh, the go for power descent. You go to continue power descent. You're a go to continue power descent. The crew acknowledged their go, and we immediately lost communications again. Despite the problems, the landing engine fired right on time, and the Eagle began its long descent towards the moon. Of course, we were going engine first, face down, uh, so that we could see the landmarks uh, moving from the bottom of the window up to the top of the window, and we could make time and landmark checks. Uh, we had very crude uh, instrumentation and capability uh, measuring at that time, but it was good enough to get the crew started down towards the surface of the moon. But as they got closer to the surface, we had to bring in the landing radar so it could update the crew's knowledge of the actual altitude. As they lost altitude, Armstrong's intense concentration was fixed on the surface outside. Aldrin was scanning the LEM instrumentation, relaying information to Houston. Then, with no warning, their troubles began. Uh, that's affirmative. Program alarm. 1202. 1202. At 34,000 feet, they had serious problems. Their computer was issuing an overload alarm, and they were only six minutes from the ground. And the computer is throwing out all these alarms and saying, you know, I've got too much to do, and if you don't lighten my workload, I'm just going to give up. When they did come on, uh, we couldn't look it up in the book to see what the problem was because we were watching where we were going, calling out uh, altitude, altitude rate. You're not exactly sure which direction, to, which path to take. Do we keep working for the landing radar thing or do we start addressing this question of the computer program alarm? It was enough to, uh, to interrupt our 
a train of thought and get us wondering, when's the next one going to come on? Right in the middle of landing, it was almost as dangerous to try and abort with a bad computer as it was to carry on with the landing. But the moon continued to grow in their windows, and the alarms continued. Go for landing, 3,000 feet. Top alarm. 1201. 1201. Roger, 1201 alarm. The 1201 alarm was more urgent than the 1202. This meant that the computer might quit completely. As Aldrin continued to relay their numbers to Armstrong, they had to find a place to set down. They were 2,000 feet and two minutes from the rocks below. As I was looking at my trajectory plot, uh, Neil leveled off at about 400 feet and was whizzing across the surface, and it wasn't the, it was far from what we trained for and seen in, in the simulation. And Neil is looking out the window and he sees this enormous crater. This is a crater the size of a football field with boulders around it that are as big as small cars, you know. We continue on down the surface. We should have been on the surface by about 10 minutes, and now as a result of this trajectory problem we had, we're further downrange from our landing site. As they neared the lunar surface, Armstrong prepared to wrest control from the errant computer. Now we get to about 500 feet, and we take over uh, manual control. And uh, at this time, I think Neil could really see that it was going where he didn't want it to go. They were nearing the point called Dead Man's Curve. If they dipped below this, it would be too late to abort. If you ever go below the Dead Man's Curve, you just don't have enough power to go back up and do an abort before you had crashed. Fuel was now getting critically low. Houston signaled 60 seconds until an abort. Forward. 60, 60, 60, 60 seconds. And uh, we did hear the uh, call of 60 seconds and, and a low level light came on. That I'm sure caused concern in the control center. They normally expected us to land with about two minutes of fuel left. And here we were down uh, and still 100 feet above the surface at uh, 60 seconds. But when I called one minute, they were starting down. And then I called 30 seconds. And we were really, I was really getting a little anxious at this point. At about that time, you know, you really start to suck air. And I'm seriously thinking now we have this land abort decision that the crew is faced with. Are they going to have sufficient fuel to land in the moon? Or are they going to have to board very close to the lunar surface, which is extremely difficult and extremely risky? 30 seconds. Forward. When it got down to 30 seconds, uh, we were about 10 feet or less. And I could see that they were in the final phases. A little bit of drifting. And, uh, and I could sneak a look out, because at that point, I don't think Neil cared what the numbers were. He was looking at the outside. Contact light. We copy you down, Eagle. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. Roger, Twink. Tranquility, we copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. Touchdown was at 4.18 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. They were four miles off target. Just 17 seconds of fuel remained for the landing. It took us a couple seconds to really realize that we had made it. And then the people in the viewing room start cheering and clapping and stomping their feet. And I, I'm so tied up emotionally at this time that I literally cannot speak. And I got to get my team back on track. And I, I wrap my arm on the console and break my pencil and finally get back on track and call my controllers to attention. Say, OK, all you flight controllers, settle down. OK, let's get back on with it. Apollo 11 was on the moon. But beneath the two astronauts in the lunar module's descent stage, a malfunction was brewing that could end the mission in a catastrophic explosion. The power of one Saturn V was enough to place in Earth orbit all US manned spacecraft launched before the Apollo program. Apollo 11 will return on Modern Marvels. The lunar module Eagle had been on the moon for about an hour by the time Armstrong and Aldrin were completing their post-landing checks. During that time, disaster had been brewing just beneath their feet in the descent stage. The cold on the moon permeated the fuel line and caused a blockage in the fuel line, which was immediately reported back by telemetry to Mission Control in Houston. That gave us cause for alarm. 
The pipe that had supplied fuel to the descent engine was plugged, and pressure was building up rapidly. If it didn't clear on its own, Kranz would have had no choice but to order an abort and head back to orbit. There was, for the, for the few seconds that this was going on, some thought given to aborting the exploration of the moon and to, to initiate the launch sequence right away. However, the heat that came out of the engine melted the ice that had formed in the line, and the problem went away. Disaster averted, Armstrong and Aldrin prepared to explore the moon. Six hours after landing, the two astronauts were ready to depart the lunar module. Now clad in their bulky moon suits, they slowly vented the air inside the lem so they could open the hatch. When we're all ready and depressurized, we're looking at the gauge as we uh, turned the valve, I think, on the handle to, uh, to vent the, the pressure for five pounds per square inch, and it went down to, to the point where it was, it was almost zero fairly quickly. We thought, well, let's, let's give it a try. We tried to pull it, the door open, and it wouldn't come open. We thought, well, <laughs> I wonder if we're going to get out or not. And it took an abnormal time for it to finally get to a point where we could pull on a fairly flimsy door, and you don't want to rupture that door and uh, leave yourself in a vacuum for the entire rest of the mission. Aldrin tugged on the edge of the thin hatch, and it swung open at last. As Aldrin guided him, Armstrong carefully left the cabin. After a cautious climb down the spindly ladder, Armstrong was standing on the footpath. It was time to make history. I'm uh, at the foot of the ladder. Yeah, I'm going to step off the lamb now. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. It was 10.56 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. As Aldrin prepared to egress, Armstrong made his first observations of the lunar surface. Surface is fine and powdery. I can, I can pick it up loosely with my toe. I only go in a small fraction of an inch, maybe an eighth of an inch, but I can see it has a stark beauty all its own. It's uh, like much of the high desert of uh, the United States. It's uh, different, but it's very pretty out here. Within the half hour, Aldrin was also out of the limb, climbing down the ladder. There you got it. That's a good step. Yep. About a three-footer. As Aldrin got to the footpad, he turned to see the view and was awestruck. Magnificent desolation. The visibility was so clear, especially looking down sun. Uh, if you look down at the uh, surface, you could clearly see a glow around the shadow of your head. Even in shadows where the, the sun didn't reach, you could see into the shadows reasonably well. Looking out on the horizon, it was so clear, you could see the moon curve away. Estimating distance was kind of difficult because uh, you don't know exactly how far away it's going to curve, and uh, the clarity is so distinct. The two explorers began to test their mobility and plant the American flag. A lot of people think because you have one six gravity that you ought to be able to jump six times higher. Wrong. You can jump to the degree that you can accelerate your mass from a standing still movement. As soon as your feet leave the ground, you're done. You, you can't do anything more. So it's the rapidity of that motion. And is that hampered by the stiffness of the suit? Yes, it is. Despite the thick, bulky suits, the two men quickly set about their other chores. One of these was to set up a simple science station, far smaller than what would be used on later missions. They created something called ESEP, which stood for Early Apollo Scientific Experiments Package. And it consisted basically of a seismometer that would detect moon moonquakes. And it was powered by solar panels and a reflector called a laser ranging retro reflector. The ESEP would remain on the moon and send back data for five weeks. The laser reflector would allow astronomers to measure the distance between the Earth and the moon to within an inch. It still works today. 
After two hours and 31 minutes, the moonwalk came to an end, and the first two men on another world grabbed their last few samples for the geologists back home. We were really not geologists. We were test pilots, fighter pilots, in an unknown environment trying to do the best that we could. And it was up to a mix of later talents so that we would get the most scientific benefit out of the achievement of, as the president said, landing a man on the moon and bringing him back safely. Within the hour, they were back inside the LEM, preparing to depart the moon. Now the biggest cliffhanger of the mission loomed. To get home, the LEM ascent engine had to fire. It was another piece of technology that had never been tried on the moon. And to complicate matters, as they were leaving the cabin, they had broken the ascent engine switch. Lunar soil is comprised of approximately 30 to 60% glass, which is one reason why the moon reflects so much light and is brilliant in our night sky. Apollo 11 will return on Modern Marvels. Armstrong and Aldrin had been on the moon for a full 21 hours and had explored outside the LEM for two and a half hours. Exhausted, they wanted to go home, but first they had to find a way to fire the ascent engine. The Grumman engineers huddled, pitching one idea after another to bypass the broken switch. Finally, a solution was found. The switch path was rerouted by Armstrong. Minutes later, he pressed the alternate ignition switch. The launch mechanism activated below them. Now this sequence is completely automatic. Once they initiate the, uh, the firing sequence, all of the things that have to happen occur automatically. Uh, one of the big things that happens is that a guillotine severs the wires and all the connections that exist between the ascent and the descent stage. It also sends a command to the ascent engine to fire. Lunar liftoff was at 124 hours, 22 minutes mission elapsed time. As the LEM ascended, it did so in an erratic weaving path. This was due to the fact that the two fuel tanks emptied at different rates, with fuels of differing densities. Since the center of gravity moves in the ascent on the lunar module, uh, in order to keep from firing thrusters kind of all the time, it, it wallows off of attitude and then you thrust it back on. It does this in, in a little bit in pitch and a little bit in roll, then it'll do it more in roll and a little bit less in pitch. So it's really kind of a, a, a lazy maneuver, and you're along for the ride. As the two craft slowly approached each other, the command module, piloted by Mike Collins, took over the rendezvous. All Armstrong and Aldrin had to do was wait. Slowly, Collins closed on the docking target. As the two craft docked, very little of the Apollo rocket that departed Earth a week earlier was left. It was now 1 40th of its original mass. Once the docking latches took hold, Armstrong and Aldrin climbed back into the waiting command module. They were tired, but jubilant, as they prepared for the last rocket engine burn necessary to get home. Once you get docked and the crew's transferred to the command module, that service propulsion system has to work. On the way home, Collins had a wry comment about the last firing of their rocket engine, which broke them free of lunar orbit. The SPF engine, our large rocket engine, on the aft end of our service module, must have performed flawlessly or we would have been stranded in lunar orbit. As they sped back toward Earth, Armstrong decided to share a few observations with Aldrin. One concerned the American flag they had planted. And he confidentially shared that it tipped over. And it doesn't look like it completely went over, but the exhaust was sure whipping the flag back and forth tremendously. About 60 hours later, it was time to let go of the service module. Its large rocket engine had taken them out of lunar orbit and prevented them from becoming, as one astronaut quipped, a permanent orbiting monument to NASA around the moon. They were now approaching Earth at over 24,000 miles per hour. Any miscalculation would force them either to enter shallow and burn up or skip off the atmosphere. They knew their re-entry alignment was critical. They aligned the command module to enter the atmosphere at a precise angle and began the fiery descent. With the air around the capsule ionized by the 5,000 degree heat, they would be out of contact with mission control. In the final stage of reentry, 
It's the crew and the spacecraft. We go through blackout. We've done the best we can for the crew. It's a difficult time. It's a lonely time for the controllers because there's only one thought in every controller's mind. Did I give the crew everything we needed to? And was my data right? There are several times in the mission where the crew's on their own. We've done the best we can, and then it's up to them and the spacecraft to finish off the mission. As the command module descended, the intense heat on the blunt end of the capsule began to melt and char the heat shield, as it was designed to do. The material, called ablative shielding, was designed to burn off and take the heat with it. As further protection against the 5,000 degree inferno, the shape of the capsule created a shockwave that also dissipated heat. As they left the fireball of re-entry behind, explosive mortars on the capsule's top blasted small drogue parachutes, which would catch the air and drag out the main chutes. These would break the landing speed to a leisurely 22 miles per hour. Soon, the astronauts were retrieved by Navy frogmen and transported to the carrier Hornet. But one more duty, longer than the mission itself, remained. For the next 21 days, there were virtual shut-ins inside a specially designed germ-proof trailer. I think the quarantine uh, in our case uh, was not necessary. However, it was a, a welcome cushioning. It did give us time to reorder our priorities, to prepare for the things that we were going to have to do once we got out. Well, Neil had a funny statement about that, a good statement about that, which was, you know, the chances of them coming back to Earth with any kind of a moon bug were tiny, 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 tiny. But the ramifications, if they did come back with a moon bug, were enormous. So you have a very, very, very small number times a very, very, very big number, and the result is, yeah, it's probably a good idea. Millions turned out to celebrate the returning space heroes. It was a high point of the 20th century. Back in Houston, the geologists cherished the rocks, all 47 pounds of them. The Apollo 11 moon rocks represented a surprising variety, considering the brief stay of their collectors. It was later said that Neil Armstrong had made one of the best sample collections of any astronaut on the moon. As the years pass and the memories of the first lunar landing begin to fade, we still have spectacular images to remember it by. Some of the best were taken by the astronauts themselves. Well, I want a before and an after, so I took a picture of flat surface, then I stuck my foot down and pulled it away and took a picture of that, and that looked so lonesome to me. So I put my foot down another time and then moved my foot away slightly so you could see the boot. Six more Apollo missions would fly to the moon. With the near disaster of Apollo 13, only five would land. By the end of the program, the astronauts had a lunar rover and were capable of staying on the moon for three days. Hundreds of miles of the surface were explored and over 842 pounds of rocks were returned. But by the time Apollo 17 flew, public support had all but vanished. Apollos 18, 19, and 20 were scrapped, and two of the Saturn launch vehicles languish in museums today. Gene Cernan and Harrison Schmidt, the last men on the moon, left on December 12, 1972. Humanity has not returned. It's time to take the best minds that we have, not only within NASA, but within the technical community, come up with a proposal cost this proposal and then find some way to articulate it to the American people as necessary to survival. Our survival is our species and our survival economically because the only way we're going to compete in this entire world is through technology. We need the nation behind us, we need the world behind us, and we need a unified appreciation that this is not going to break the bank that everything we expend on exploration is going to be returned to us as a nation and us as a world many-fold. The promise of America's space exploration is to move from magnificent desolation to magnificent inspiration. <laughs>